Well, hello and welcome. We are coming to the end of another week, and uh, we've been looking at Second Peter. We've gone through chapters, our verses one through four. Well, actually, we're not quite through verse four. There's one more phrase that I want to link into verse five. But before I get into that, I just wanted to mention that uh, today is my wife and I's 54th wedding anniversary. I remember when I thought 50 years of age was old, and now I'm celebrating my 54th wedding anniversary. Um, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm I'm extremely proud of that accomplishment. You know, you you recognize in this world that most people don't last this long, and most people give up because being married is is difficult because. You're not always happily married. There are there are a lot of great times and there are some difficult times and there are some journeys and struggles that you go through simply because you're partnering together with another person to go through life and deal with the hardships. It's great to have a partner. It's great to have somebody to share the tears and the fears with when you go through them. Which reminds me of a joke I heard one time of a young man who was in an auto accident and he was uh, seriously injured and uh, the police officer came up but before he tried to get him out of the car and extract him without injuring him further. And he asked the young man, he said, well, uh, are you married? And the young man said, no, this is the worst trouble I've ever been in. I always thought that was funny because you realize that coming together in a relationship doesn't simplify life. I mean, you think that before you get married because you're thinking of all the things that this person you're married can do for you. And you realize that what you've also taken on is a whole lot of other responsibilities to do things and care for them. And until you really wrap your heart and your mind around that and fully embrace that, you're going to find yourself feeling like you've gotten into some serious trouble here. I think that one of the most wonderful things about being married is that you have somebody who loves you unconditionally. And not and I mean that, that they don't just accept you for who you are, but they really value you and they want to be with you. And as, as uh, I heard a quote one time in Israel, just really connected me, he said, I like me best when I'm with you. It was written in a little plaque in Hebrew. I like me best when I'm with you. And I think that's the essence of what it means to be in a meaningful relationship with another person. Too many people I know today are what we call married singles. Um, you're basically, you know, have this kind of common ground that you share. And I, I say that because sadly, that was the relationship that my parents had. I, I was totally unprepared to be a husband or a father because my parents, um, they had separate bedrooms, they had separate careers, they had pretty much a separate lifestyle and would come together occasionally uh, to celebrate a birthday or Christmas or something of that nature, but they really didn't have anything in common and, and didn't really like each other that much and get along very well. And you grow up with that and you realize, I don't have any idea how to build and maintain a relationship. And that's where the real challenge came in. It was to be not just always thinking of yourself, and what you wanted in your welfare, but to be able to begin to make those decisions based upon how it's going to affect others, especially those who have to share the car and the journey and the house with you through life. So I'm thankful that I have a, a loving, caring wife who supports me. She's also very honest, who she won't lie to me if it's not true. So <laughs> she tells me the truth about myself, even though I don't want to hear it sometimes. Well, I don't want to hear it most of the time, unless it's flattering. But that's the simple reality is that you realize, as my wife said to me one time, I wouldn't say these things to you if I didn't love you. Because she said, if you look bad, it makes me look bad. <laughs> so I thought, okay, there's some self-interest there. I can identify and understand this. But this is why when we talk about even our relationship with Christ, it's the same dynamics that we, in many ways, want to kind of go through life in this world by ourselves. We want to be, you know, these lone rangers who make our own way. We, we grab life by the throat and we make it submit to our will. When, in fact, we find that what it does is it beats us to a pulp, you know. It's kind of like if you grab a badger by the neck, he, he has four claws, four feet that'll claw you to shreds and you'll be nothing but a bloody mass of mess on the ground in a few moments. And that's often what happens to people. They're going to conquer life and life ends up decimating them and they're laying on the ground bloody. Fortunately, we have a God who recognizes that even though someone may be rejected by men, 
as was the case with Jesus. Jesus was chosen by God and was precious to him. And because we are in Christ and we are part of his family, we now too are chosen by God and we are precious to him so that not only does he become a living stone in our lives, but Peter goes on in verse 5 and says, you also become like living stones. Then all those, in other words, that not only is God's word written in our hearts with his finger, engraved with his finger, but we begin to become objects that go out and begin to engrave God's word into the hearts and the lives of other people. I think it's important for us to understand, uh, because I, I really didn't grasp this when I was a father, uh, when my kids were young, was that I had a tremendous ability to engrave things on my children's heart. And, and to some degree, that's been successful. and some degree, it hasn't been. Uh, you know, and I think that it's important that those of you who are feeling a lot of guilt and shame because you have prodigal children, I find that the number who have prodigal children is, is huge today in the church. And part of that is our fault, and part of it is not our fault. But I think at the same time, as one of the, as the rabbis used to say, you can blame the first 40 years on your parents, but the second 40 years on you. One of the things I find is oftentimes people as adults into their 40s, 50s, 60s are still blaming their parents for how messed up their life is, which is such a waste of time and energy. And I've often said to them, if you can identify where your parents screwed up, and there aren't any parents who haven't screwed up, by the way. But if you can identify where they screwed up, then you have no excuse for continuing to behave in the same way. In other words, you need to stop looking at them and blaming them, and you start need, need to looking at Jesus and learning from him, letting him become the significant other that begins to imprint himself on your heart and your mind. And when you do that, you become a living stone. You, Because you are built into, he says, a spiritual house. You become the temple of the Holy Ghost. You become a spiritual person in which a, the Spirit of God dwells. He goes on to say, you become a holy priesthood. A priest was one who represented God to the people. He stood in God's place doing for them what God desired to do for them. And he says, you begin to offer spiritual sacrifices. So your interaction with them becomes a sacrifice. Yes, a, a laying down. But basically, you're spiritually implanting things in other people, which he says is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So it's this whole idea of this transmission of our faith from first from God to us, and then in turn being able to transmit it to others that makes the profound difference. Now, sadly, uh, many people conclude that what that means is I need to get my Bible and a handful of tracts and go into the park and start preaching to people. I have nothing wrong. I see nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing that. And that's a great thing. If God passions you and gives you the opportunity to do it, believe me, I have done a lot of that in my life. And it's fascinating. And sometimes you see the power of God manifest themselves in ways that you never imagined. But it's not the heart of what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that we most powerfully connect with people who are in our own sphere of influence. Someone once said the most powerful place to preach the gospel is across the dinner table. So that when we're sitting down with other people over food, when we're working together, people on a project, uh, when we're just simply walking and exercising and running and doing life, if you will, it's the doing of life that reveals most powerfully that how you do life is significantly different than how they're doing life without Jesus. The doing life with Jesus just naturally manifests itself. I just remember how I had to go in for physical therapy for a very lengthy period of time at one point. And uh, what they were doing is trying to break away scar tissue in my shoulder. They spent two months torturing me, essentially. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, tears would be running down my cheeks and I don't cry easily. But, and uh, the gentleman who was my therapist kept on thanking me because he said, you know, most people get really angry with us because we're causing them so much pain. And he says, we know we are, but 
That's the only way that we can basically affect the kind of healing and change that you're going to need if you don't want if you want to be able to use your arm effectively. Well, most of you understand that dynamic. But what was interesting to me is that after a few months of having him work with me three times a week, he said, you know, you're not like what I thought pastors were like. <laughs> I had no idea what he meant. Other than the fact, he just said, you know, he just really had come to enjoy me and respect me as a person. And we kind of developed this relationship. It was a powerful thing, just simply because I was doing, allowing him to work on me from the perspective that I'm a follower of Jesus. I wasn't trying to preach to him. I was just trying to live out my faith in a normal, natural way. And so I would simply say it's doing life that gives you the most impactful opportunity. And that's why as I end up here, I say 54 years married. It's amazing. We've had highs and we've had lows. And we've had scary times and difficult times and painful times. We've rejoiced together and we've wept together. And we've been depressed together as well as being enraptured together in one another's love. She is my best friend, my closest companion. Never want to do life without her, even though if God tarries, that will probably happen for one of us. But the simple fact of the matter is that the fact that we've been stayed married for 54 years is not itself a statement that it can be done. And it can be done by ordinary people who simply focus on following Jesus and not following their own fleshly desires. So, Hope that encourages you. Have a great weekend. I pray that your celebration together with other believers at church will be wonderful, fantastic, fabulous, because we need each other. God bless you and go on His grace.